Um, okay, so, uh, so I'm gonna talk about the future uh, of automation. Um, you know, one thing that is uh, funny when you decide to talk about the future uh, and a little nerve wracking is that the easy way to talk about the future is to uh, prognosticate, right? Uh, so like, I'm, I'm in the, the, the lucky position to be able to spend time thinking about the future. Uh, most people aren't. Um, they have to do like work at their job, which usually involves not thinking about the future and instead just doing the work that's in front of you. Um, but the more that I have done this and the more that I have learned and thought about things, um, the easy path for this talk uh, was to just tell you what I think the future will be. Um, and instead, I decided to think about, uh, about what the truth of that is. And so when I started digging in to that, um, I tend to start by going backwards. Um, so rather than starting with the future, I tend to look to the past um, because it's informed so much uh, of the work that I have done. Um, and when you go into the past and you think about, you're thinking about people who could predict the future, you're thinking about people who, who created the future, um, one of the greatest places, probably the single greatest uh, place for innovation and for the invention of the future in computer systems was PARC, right? Um, and PARC invented laser printing, they invented ethernet, they invented the PC, they invented GUIs, they invented object orientation, they, elect they invented electronic paper, uh, they uh, VLSI semiconductors, on and on and on and on. In this like 10 year period, they created almost everything, laptop, uh, tablets, right? Almost everything uh, that we now use. At some point, there was this small set of people and they just did it. Um, and this guy, whose face is, uh, is up here, is Alan Kay. How many people know Alan Kay? Oh, more of you need to know Alan Kay. I, I almost didn't give you this talk. I was writing the talk and I was reading Alan Kay a lot. Uh, and I was like, I'm awful. <laughs> like what I should do is just read you Alan Kay's speeches as like an interpretive dance. Um, <laughs> but, um, but Alan Kay has an incredible quote uh, about the future and it is this. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. Yes. Uh, and that, is the central theme of this talk. I think that if what we're gonna do is talk about the future of, of configuration management, it is the people in this room, most likely, who have the best possible shot uh, at predicting that future through inventing it, through the creation of that future. And so I wanna talk about that process that I have gone through, um, and I wanna talk about maybe some possible directions uh, in case you need some inspiration. So as I was talking about putting this talk together, I'm reading this book about Motley Crue. How many people like Motley Crue? At least a few other people like Motley Crue. I love metal. I'm wearing a Converge shirt. It's not a secret if you've seen me talk. That guy's Tommy Lee. Um, Tommy Lee plays the drums in Motley Crue. Um, and I'm putting this talk together and I'm feeling bad about Alan Kay. And then Tommy Lee, I'm not kidding, says this shit to me. People say that you can't predict the future, but I know that's bullshit. I predicted my future when I was three and in a childish effort to make louder and better noises, arranged pots and pans on the kitchen floor and wailed on them with spoons and knives. And I gotta tell you, I feel a lot like Tommy Lee. <laughs> um, you know, I, my, I remember when I was eight and my parents brought home a PC and it had a modem and my mom used it to dial in uh, to, she's a real estate agent and she was dialing into the multiple listing service and I was like, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. What else can you call with the computer? And like, that was it. The entire arc of my life has been one line from that moment of curiosity till now. Um, and Tommy Lee couldn't be more different than Alan Kay as a human being, I suspect. Um, but his gist is identical, right? Um, the future for Tommy Lee was he was going to play the drums. That was it. And he always knew, and that was a future he invented. And you could look at it from the past and be like, well, of course. Um, but it wasn't so clear when he was three. Another great person from our computing past is Alan Perlis. Um, and Alan Perlis wrote this incredible list of epigrams uh, about his career in computer science toward the end of his life. Um, and he had this incredible quote, which is, is it possible that software is not like anything else? That it is meant to be discarded? That the whole point is always to see it as a soap bubble? Um, and I think Alan had true wisdom in that statement. I think the truth of the software we build and of the things that we do and the cultures we create, the point 
is that they're beautiful. And when you blow that bubble, like I've blown a giant bubble with Chef, and Luke blew a giant bubble with Puppet, and Mark has thrown in a huge bubble with CF Engine. And at some point, uh, you know that that bubble will pop. <laughs> and it's gone forever. Um, but more bubbles are coming up behind you, you know? Uh, and for the folks who blew them, they are the most beautiful and perfect bubbles that they've ever blown. Maybe that analogy got away from me. But, uh, <laughs> but there's two good things in here. The first one is you should expect that your invention will someday pop, that at some point it won't matter anymore. Uh, and the second is that you can always blow more bubbles. OK, so I think people who invent the future have varying degrees of two motivations is one way to put it, but also just backgrounds. There's two things that they do um, that, that get them over the line. Um, the first one is research. So this is thinking about what's possible. And it's best if you can do this a little untethered to what's practical, right? Um, I think Mark is the best example of this that I know in our field, where like he's just thinking about stuff. He's thinking about the future, and he's thinking about the world around him, and he's thinking about what we could have. And then, yes, he gets practical eventually, but like for a lot of that, he's out. Like he's gone. He's thinking about stuff far untethered um, from whatever the reality of what we can build is. And the second thing, and I think Luke touched on this in a way that was sort of the perfect lead-in to my talk, is irritation. Um, it's, it's an inability to live with the status quo. It's, it's, that, it's that thing where you're like, man, I just, I, you're right there, except you're wrong here, right? Um, and often this really looks like a rejection of orthodoxy, right? If you do research and you come up with a great idea, and then you build that thing, and you blow that soap bubble, and it's working, and it's going, and it's there, and then someone comes up to you and goes, hey, 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 I know this thing you dedicated your whole life to. It's the most beautiful thing in the world. You're just wrong about these two things. The, the natural human reaction is to be like, well, I don't know, maybe fuck off, right? Because um, like, I don't, I'm pretty sure I'm the best in the world at the thing I'm doing right now, and you're just in my face being a gnat. And you're like, no, 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 I'm not a gnat. You're, I love you so much, but, but you're fucking wrong. And then like, um, and you're like, stop telling me I'm wrong. I, like, I blew this giant bubble, and then you fucking pop it. You know what I mean? Um, and so, so let's talk about research before we loop back to irritation. So <clears throat> a good rule of thumb when you're doing research is if, when you're, if what you're thinking about isn't something other people are going to discover in about a decade, then you're probably not thinking far enough in the future, right? Um, if you're not thinking about what is it that somebody else is going to come up with 10 years, 20 years down the line, then what you're thinking about from the research point of view probably isn't researchy enough, right? Because it's probably a little too practical. It's probably, it's probably a little more on the irritation soap bubble end. Another thing that came from Park that I think is important when you do research, and we'll talk a little more about this, is Error 33. Um, so they talked about Error 33 as uh, the moment that you allow your research to be dependent on a third party in order to be true. So as soon as your research was dependent on a vendor or was dependent on another research project in order to be real, you were committing Error 33. Um, and so the upside of this was that they were fabulously prolific, right? Um, because in each of those projects, they invented every single component that went into that thing. So they, they needed, to, uh, they needed the, to invent the microcomputer so that they could then invent Smalltalk so they could then invent the GUI. But they never asked themselves, oh, there's no operating system in order to build the GUI that I want. They just wrote the operating system to run the GUI. Right? It didn't do any of the other things. They just did it. Um, and so they could have this fabulous burst of productivity because all of the tooling and everything that they did was purpose built to fit. It was pointed at that one research problem. It was, can I solve this one thing? Can I build this thing from the ground to the end? And because of that, their research was very, very productive. Now, there's a flip side to this, which is that once we've gotten through all of that research and we've soaked all of that effort and we've put all that work in, it can be very wasteful to have to build your own operating system, right? How many people have written their own operating system? I have not. What's up, dude? This guy has. Um, would you do it again to write a configuration management system? No. OK. So, so maybe you should write your own operating systems. Maybe you shouldn't. I think, again, Alan Kay uh, sort of swoops in and tells you a good way to think about this, which is if you can build your own tools and things to build your research, you should, which I think is probably right. Like The value of that is probably so high that it outstrips not doing it. When do you do it? It's hard to say. Another thing about research uh, is that community is really critical to the existence 
of, of moving ideas forward. You have to have other people to kick your ideas around with, right? Um, and on top of that, um, you need to be able to stand on the shoulders of other people. Um, again, an Alan Kay quote, uh, he says, point of view is worth 80 IQ points. And I think he's right. Um, I am absolutely not smarter than Mark Burgess and Luke Kinnies. Not even a little. I'm probably less smart. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> I think I'm less smart. However, um, I have the advantage of their point of view, right? I get to listen and understand and absorb what they said and what they wrote and how they thought and what they built. And then I got to take that thing and build another thing, right? Um, and, uh, and, and so it goes, right? Hopefully other people have learned from me uh, and we will stand together uh, with this body of knowledge that moves us all forward as a community. Um, in fact, I spent most of my time in this talk going back in time and reading about that community. I, I went back and read the CF Engine mailing list from when Luke was, was, was working on it. I reread all the papers, uh, like the ISConf paper that talked about, sort of ended the debate between congruence and convergence. How many people remember that debate? A few of us. It was a good debate. And also, Luke destroyed it in this paper. If you've never read it, you should. Like, he literally rips it to part and was like, this is dumb. Because um, he was probably, uh, well, I'm jumping ahead. OK, so, uh, and so in this moment, of darkness, where I'm going back and I'm reading all of these great things that all of these people have written, I felt very small as a person. I was like, man, what have I really done, you know? Um, and that's where I was like, maybe I'll just read Alan Kay as an interpretive dance. And, uh, and at that moment, the power of community was revealed unto me. My friend, John Allspaw, said this to me. Remember that all along the watchtower was Dylan's song. It took Hendrix to make it sing. Kay's material in your mind would be excellent. And I think John, I, A, as a gift to me as a person, that was beautiful. And it, it's what I needed in that moment. But nothing should, should charge us up more as people than the idea that someone would take your ideas in their mind and make them excellent, right? If you can learn something from Mark or from me or from Luke or from each other, and then through your own brain, what comes out the other side is another beautiful soap bubble that we couldn't have imagined. That is the power of a community. That's the power of, of, of thought and of ideas and of research. And so I already talked about Mark uh, at the very beginning of this, and you saw Mark earlier today, so I won't, I won't spend too much time talking about it. But you know, this room does exist because of Mark's research, I think. My career does. And I discover things that Mark knew a decade or two ago constantly, right? Um, all the time. Um, I go back to things that he wrote, and I'm like, wow, I can't believe you knew that. And I'm now lucky enough that I know him well enough that every once in a while I can bother him and be like, hey, did you know this thing? <laughs> like, I discovered this thing. Did you know it? And usually he's like, yeah, yeah. That's an interesting implementation of that idea that I had 30 years ago, or whatever. Um, <laughs> um, let's have coffee, you know? Um, and so the, the, the real reason I put this up is that I'm, I, I, I can't be Mark, right? Uh, and when I try to be Mark, and I have tried, uh, like there's a, there's a moment in like learning to speak where like I really admire his talks because they're so dense and they're so full of this deep, centered knowledge about the shape of the world. And I would love to be a person who can deliver that, but I'm not. I'm the person who puts up like Tommy Lee photos and says shit. Um, but I can learn from him, uh, and I can bang the crap out of my pots and pans. Do you know what I mean? Like, I can just hit my pots and pans as hard as I can, and I can learn from the things that he has done. And that is, is a huge piece of the power of research. It gives, because it gives us this vision of the future, and, and it allows other people to then create that future from whole cloth. And sometimes, if we're lucky, we get to create that future ourselves and ship it, like Mark did with CF Engine, like Luke did with Puppet, like I did with Chef. Uh, and, if, and if we're lucky enough that the things we think up matter, then inevitably what's going to happen is this. This is Arthur C. Clarke, and he said, if an elderly but distinguished scientist says that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. But if he says that it is impossible, he is very probably wrong. And this is what leads us to irritation. Because when people that we admire, uh, or, or when anyone, spends their time building up a, bodily, a body of thought and of work, they inevitably become orthodox about their work. Their point of view defines their world. And that's normal. It's fine. Um, but it becomes very irritating. <laughs> and so it, eventually what happens is you get a new point of view. You take in that knowledge, and you see a thing, and you can split off 
as Luke talked about it. You, can, you, can, you see a moment where if you turned it just a little, you think you would get a better response. And so we all saw Luke earlier. I think this is a good photo of Luke, just as an FYI. I often talk about Mark Burgess as the handsomest man in configuration management, and I still sort of stand by that, like as a thing. I think he's the best looking of the lot. Is that weird to say? <laughs> I think maybe the weird thing about it is that I say it too much. Have I? <laughs> I've actually had people be like, so is it weird? And I'm like, I don't think it's weird. I've never, anyway, it's probably weird. It's fine. But I, then I saw this photo of Luke, and I was like, damn, though. Like, anyway. Um, right, though? He's a good-looking guy. OK, so people forget, because Puppet has been so successful, and Luke himself has been so successful talking about Puppet and the things that it has done, that, that Luke was, at the very least, from 2003 to 2006, and I imagine before, but I can only find evidence back to 2003, I suspect he was the single greatest practitioner of configuration management on the planet. There was probably no one better than him at the work of configuration management in that era. No one. Um, and he put that theory into practice over and over and over again. And he helped a humongous number of people. Like If you go back to the CF Engine mailing list and you type in Luke Kniez, what you get is a thousand emails from Luke helping people figure out how to move configuration management forward over and over and over and over. And you can hear in the evolution of those emails this, like, this constant thing, this, this knot in his brain where he's like, man, it's just, we're so close, but it's wrong. And in that paper where he rips ISConf apart and basically ends the convergence and congruence debate, inside there is this kernel of, of truth. Um, uh, 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 about the resource abstraction layer and about the need to relate resources to hosts. Um, and later on, Luke's giving an interview with O'Reilly, and he says this. I started Puppet with a core hypothesis, considered stupid by the experts around me. There was no point in talking to them. Anyone can talk, and listeners similarly get to pick their conclusions. Only those I could prove had merit. And this is because no matter how many times Luke went into a room and said, hey, I think CF Engine is pretty right, except this way we relate resources to hosts isn't, it's not quite right. Like, it's too much. It's too hard to do. Like, what, and I, could, I can build this like, weird two-headed hydra, but that doesn't feel right either. And, but when he talks about it in the abstract, the people around him are like, I don't know. I don't have that problem. <laughs> you know, they're like, I run a computer lab. I don't have that many hosts, or it's not that big a deal. Um, and... And so eventually that irritation leads Luke to take this big idea of the resource abstraction layer, which he got to standing on the top of Mark, of Steve Traggett, Alva Couch, all these people who had done all this research and all this thought. And Luke was steeped in that theory, and he was steeped in that practice. He, knew, he still knows that theory. Like He could still, I'm sure, have those arguments with you if you want. He was, probably doesn't want to. But he could. Um, and at the time, he had both that theory and, the, and he was the best in the world at doing it. And he realized that he, had to, he was going to have to go build it. He was going to have to be the person who creates it. And you can still find in the historical record the moments where he tried to build it inside of Mark's soap bubble, right? Inside of CF Engine, he, he tried. He was like, I want to do it. And in that moment, he was committing error 33, right? Um, he, and it wasn't because it wasn't out of, you know, he wanted to do, to communicate, he wanted to collaborate, he wanted to have it be the same thing. But the truth was, he was actually branching out on his own. He was doing research that was going to prove whether what he believed was true was right or wrong. And it wasn't until he decided to own his entire destiny that he could actually prove the reality of that truth. This is me. Uh, uh, you know, it's funny when you're standing there and you have to put a space of yourself in your own talk to quote yourself. Um, and so I get to choose my own picture. So, um, so years later, I was standing on those same shoulders, right? At now including Luke's. And I was running this consultancy like Luke talked about. Uh, and it was the early days of the cloud. So it was the first uh, Facebook apps were a thing. And so the, that was really the first time you could start a company that would just reach massive scale instantaneously. And so we had this, we had this consulting company. We had helped a few people scale in particular their Facebook apps, um, and we were using Puppet to do it. And I had two problems uh, that were in front of me. And the first one was determinism. Um, the way Puppet was built at the time, um, we were running probably the largest installations of Puppet on the planet by resource count. So like, you know, we might have, 
I tried to go back and look at the source code, um, but I couldn't find it. So this is from roughly my memory, but it was somewhere in the neighborhood of like 1,500 to 2,000 Puppet resources per host, right? Which was, I think, probably still a lot, but it was a lot then for sure. And when we were building the graph, like I had this struggle um, to figure out, uh, I, honestly, I just couldn't get the dependencies right. And so I couldn't depend that the order would be okay. And normally, if I just was launching boxes relatively slowly, it was fine. But in this world of like hyperscale Facebook growth, it wasn't because if, if, if it failed to build correctly one time out of 300, that was irritating. But sometimes it would fail 50 times in a row, right? And like my customers were angry. They were like, hey, dude, I need this thing to work in a couple minutes because I got a million customers. Um, and so I would talk about that problem. Uh, my second one was flexibility. I had all these customers, uh, and they wanted to integrate with the other tools they were using, and it was hard to do that, at least for me. And so you can find in the historical record my own moment where I committed error 33. And I wrote this long blog post in an attempt to help the Puppet community understand my problems. Um, uh, and it went on and on and on. Like, it was a really long blog post. So as a communicator, it wasn't probably my shiningest hour. But, um, but I, I, in particular, I was talking about this need for determinism. And I was saying, hey, I think you really, like, I think the directed graph is overkill for this problem that we have. And if we worked it this way, then the system would be deterministic in this way that I really needed. And here's what Luke said to me. This is the road to hell, I absolutely promise you. Um, <laughs> And remember, Luke Kinnies was the best in the world at this task. He had defeated the dragons of his own orthodoxy and was bringing to the world this incredible soap bubble. And here was this guy in Seattle making money with his product, right, uh, who was poking at his bubble. Um, and so who can blame him for, having, for being irritated at that activity? And then years later, Michael DeHaan shows up. This is Michael. Um, the cobbler guy, right? comes along and he basically says, all this theory and all this work that we've been doing is in the way of the job at hand. His insight was all this theory mongering and all this like discussion about convergence and resource abstractions and languages and DSLs, all of it's bullshit um, and you're wasting time. What matters is the user experience. What matters is I need to do X on a bunch of Y and I want to do it right now, right? Um, Here's a quote. He said, I couldn't bring myself to be settled with the tools that we had to use. It was too frustrating. Um, and here, in case you think that in this talk, uh, I don't know if, if he tried to commit error 33. Um, I know he worked at Puppet for a while. Maybe he tried to convince the people at Puppet that that was more important than other things. I don't know. He certainly never tried to convince me. And it, but if he had, I would have rejected him, just so we're clear. Um, because I was busy building my amazing soap bubble, and I'd have been like, get out of here, cobbler guy, right? Um, but in case you wonder that I am immune, I am not. Here is what I have said, both to people who work for me uh, and people in the broader community when I talk about Ansible. Nobody will ever want to program in YAML and Jinja. <laughs> and I'm going to stand by that statement, because I don't think anybody who programs wants to fucking program in YAML and Jinja. Raise your hand. Here's the second thing. I'm pretty sure everybody who uses Ansible in this room is like, yeah, that's the fucking point. I don't want to program at all, asshole. <laughs> Right? And you can see it built into my sentence there, right? My soap bubble's about programming, right? Luke and Mark were like, you need a declarative language built just for this. I'm like, fuck it, I can, sure I want it to be declarative. I want a programming language though. I want power. I want to do all the crazy bullshit I want to do. And they're like, yeah, but that's all bad things. And I'm like, yeah, but that's the delicious secret bad sauce and I want to eat it, you know? Um, <laughs> uh, also, it will never scale. That was my other one. I'm like, and we know this won't scale because of research and theory. Uh, to which I think the Ansel people would say, it scales enough. And so we don't care about your theoretical massive scale. Um, Michael knew the orthodoxy, right? He knew, he knew the theory, right? He knew the, he knew the background. He just didn't care because for him, he was irritated that all of that theory and all of that stuff was creating a terrible user experience for the people who cared uh, about doing configuration management. This is another great story from outside configuration management. This is Jeffrey Snover. And he's the guy who invented PowerShell. Um, and he says, PowerShell is such a great product because I am a deeply flawed human being. Um, and 
the context in which he gave you this was, was thinking about, you know, he worked at Microsoft and had for a very long time, and Microsoft was the land of, of GUIs, right, and, and clicking, and the idea that that simple user experience for complex tasks was part of the value prop of Windows. Um, but he knew that it lacked power compared to what he saw people doing in Linux and Unix, that it, they, it wasn't as expressive as those things were. And if, as, as you became an expert, uh, Windows really fell off in terms of what you could do. And so he took a demotion, right? He was a very high-ranking human. He took a demotion, and he went, and he, did, and he built PowerShell. And then this is an apocryphal story. We don't know if it's true. The next time I see Jeffrey, I'm going to ask him. But, he, but some of the internet says this is so, that at some point, he had a meeting with Bill Gates uh, to talk about PowerShell and to pitch Bill on this thing that he was building. And this is what Bill Gates said. Bill Gates. <laughs> you ready? What part of fucking Windows don't you understand? <laughs> now, I don't know if Bill Gates said this, but I like to think he did. In particular, because I think it really brings home this part of my talk, which is, if you get to a place in your own research that the people you respect the most react like Bill Gates, you're onto something. <laughs> you just are. Um, and, and, it, and, and I hope that you find a better path where, like, uh, you know, Luke and I hurt each other uh, as human beings, and like every time somebody talks shit about Chef, it hurts. Every time they talk shit about Puppet, it hurts. Every time they talk about CF Engine, it hurts, right? And so like, we've done damage to each other in ways that I wish we had not, um, and I wish that our communities had not. And so I hope maybe we find a way to do that in the future uh, with less damage. Um, maybe you can, maybe you can't, but the truth is, it's equal parts. Research, both your own, and knowing the research of others, and irritation. Uh, that I think really will allow you to invent the future. Um, and so maybe you have found, you know the research, and you've found your irritation, um, and you've decided it's time that you're going to go create this thing you want to build. You're going to go create the future. What should you do next? Um, and so this is what I do. So I don't know what other people do, but this is my process uh, for trying to invent new stuff. So the first thing I do, uh, is I immerse myself in whatever is already there. So uh, I familiarize myself with all the relevant research, with all the actual tooling that's already been built to do this thing. Um, so while creating Habitat, for example, uh, I wound up reading every paper ever written that I could find uh, about gossip protocols and distributed systems from 1980 forward. Um, and that's because I knew I needed to build one and I needed to understand what those things were. Um, when I was building Chef, I obsessively read everything I could get my hands on about the theory of configuration management. Um, uh, when I was building continuous delivery tools, I was doing the same thing. So I think the other piece you have to do here is play with the existing tools. Even if your, your radical idea is that they're terrible tools, if you haven't reached some level of expertise with them, you don't really know and you're gonna go back and sort of commit those sins in the past. And remember Alan Kay, perspective is worth 80 IQ points. So no matter how smart you think you are, being able to know where other people have been and what they have built, that's the thing that will really catapult you from regular intelligence to what appears from the outside, like genius. So the second thing I do after I've sort of immersed myself in whatever it is that I'm doing, is I try to create Slack. Um, and there's something kind of paradoxical in this, but this is my family on vacation. Uh, we were in Mexico. Uh, and I took uh, a little more than a month off uh, from Chef. And uh, I was in Mexico for like maybe three weeks of that. Um, and while I was there, I was doing this stuff. I was out playing in the waves with my kid. I was on the beach. I was, uh, I we were looking at Mayan ruins. Like we were doing everything except this. Um, and, but in the back of my mind, all that immersion that I had done in the, in the month or two months leading up to that was rolling around in the back of my brain. Uh, and then later, uh, toward the end of my vacation, I was smoking a cigar and drinking tequila and watching the sunset. And I was like, hey, I think we have, I think there's an application problem. I think we're thinking wrong about the shape of the application. And what if we, what if applications could behave uh, as well-behaved actors in like a promise theory sense? And like, what would the promises those applications make be to each other? And from there, it led to Habitat. Um, and I don't think I'd have had that idea if I hadn't taken that vacation, right? So the creation of Slack is, is a big piece of it. There's another great story about the professional songwriters who write pop songs, and they spend most of their day not writing pop songs. They spend their day going about doing whatever they're doing. They're smoking weed, 
they're hanging out, they're doing anything except writing a pop song. But every once in a while, they'll hear something and they'll put it in their phone. They'll be like, ba -da -ba -boop -boop -boop, right? And then later, they'll go into like, uh, to like some studio with like a, you know, I don't know, a producer. And the producer will be like, here's my fat beats. You see, I'm a metal person. And, uh, <laughs> and they'll be like, okay, play the fat beats. And then they'll like sing back the weird noises they heard in their phone. And now comes, you know, Rihanna, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, which part was working? Was it the slack part where they were smoking weed and hanging out, or was it the part where they were in the booth? I would argue it's both. Okay, so the next thing I do is build a story map. So uh, Jeff Patton wrote a book, it's called User Story Mapping, you should, you should read it. Um, but the gist of Jeff's work is really that rather than making a backlog and trying to think about the product you're building, what he talks about is that you should be thinking about it as how can I put the story of my product, the arc, of what I need to build. And the more deeply everybody who's working on something understands the story of what we're building, the more they can bring themselves to the problem. And so uh, I always go and build a story map. Um, one interesting thing about story maps is I tried to find Habitat's original story map, but uh, I think it's in a tool that I've stopped using. Um, but this is, a, this is for a prototype for something that we actually wind up not shipping. But, um, but up at the top there, you can see, um, I think, Oh, no, you can't because of where it cuts off. Well, at the top, you can't see it, but there's some bigger sticky note looking cards. Um, and they form what's called a backbone. And the backbone is all of the high level ideas that someone's going to go through as they're using your product or as you're using your idea, right? And that backbone often stays the same. Like if I showed you the original story map from Habitat, that's pretty much the roadmap today. Like there's not a lot of new stuff that's inside that backbone. Every single detailed sticky we wrote about what to do was wrong. All of it, right? We didn't do almost any of it. The backbone, super right. Details, super wrong. I think that's just a truth of software development. And the sooner you get used to that, the faster you can be at sort of bringing your good ideas into the world. Um, then you need to build a prototype. So you have this map of what you think you should build, and now you need to build something that you can show to other people. And one trick to prototypes is that it's easy to want a prototype for the world. So you want to build a prototype f that it sort of hits the, the, the fullness of what it could be, and, and that's a mistake. Um, you first should prototype for like 10 people, and it helps a lot if you know who they are. So like one of my prototypes in my head when I was building Habitat was Mark. Because I was like, if I can show Habitat to Mark Burgess and Mark Burgess doesn't throw up in his mouth, then, <laughs> then I wasn't wrong about that piece of theory that I believed I could extend in this way, right? And later I did. I got to show it to him, and he didn't throw up in his mouth. Or if he did, he didn't show it, which is just as good. Um, um, but I had a bunch of other people in mind. Julian Dunn was one, right? I showed early prototypes of Habitat to Julian, um, there's, and there's, there's others in this room, um, where... You know, there were people who I knew had enough background to understand what my prototype was, to follow where I was going, right? Um, but that, that question of can I convince 10 people that my thing is worth doing is a good one. Um, because if you can't, then maybe your map was wrong, or maybe your hypothesis was wrong, or maybe you just shouldn't build it, like that story map I showed you earlier, where like, I could convince myself that there was value in the thing we built, but not in the shape of how we built it. Um, this guy's Larry Tesler. He's another amazing Park alumni. He is the inventor of copy and paste. How many of you ever copy and pasted? <laughs> yeah, well, let's have a clap for Larry. <laughs> there was a time nobody had ever cut and pasted, just as a, that's weird. And he's like the original user experience researcher. Um, and Larry has a law, and it's called the law of conservation of complexity. And here's what it says. Every application has an inherent amount of irreducible complexity. The only question is, who will have to deal with it? The user, the application developer, or the platform developer? And Larry is super duper, duper right. Because let's think about the Ansible puppet chef thing uh, in Habitat too. Like Habitat's the most complex system I have ever built by a wide margin. Like it is much more complex than Chef. Um, it has, I think, a much easier user experience. Um, and that's part of why Habitat is so complex under the hood, right? Um, I think the, one of the other side effects of thinking about the theory of complexity when you're doing uh, implementation work is that uh, you can sort of decide where you want to be in the spectrum. Because one thing that happens when you pull too much complexity, uh, when, you, when, you, when you hide complexity too much, what happens is people want to get their hands on it. 
So they sort of instantly want to take control again, right? Um, because it's just natural, it's human nature. And so there's this sweet spot between showing someone enough complexity that they can do everything they need to do and feel like they could take control if they wanted to, but not so much complexity that they can't do anything. Um, cars are a really good example of this, where like to start a car used to be this incredible chore that involved not breaking your arm. Like there were like five ways to break your arm on a Model T, right? Just to start the thing. And now it's like you push a button and you move on. Um, okay. Uh, so I would say that when you're thinking about the law of conservation of complexity and building your new things, uh, decide where in that spectrum you really want to be. Uh, are you building a thing whose design is to allow the user to do complicated tasks? If so, it's okay to expose some complexity to the user, right? Because that's their goal. Um, is it to allow them to do simple tasks? I want to do a bunch of things on these servers, relatively simple. How much abstraction should I put between those two goals? Almost nothing. Hence, YAML and Jinja, right? Okay, uh, this is Cyril Northcote, Northcote Parkinson. Uh, he was a uh, British civil servant, uh, and he, in the 1950s, wrote a very funny article for The Economist. And in it, he invented what is known as Parkinson's Law. And it is, any task will inflate until all of the available time is spent. Um, and uh, the truth of this is, especially when you're doing new stuff, if you find yourself in a situation where you have infinite time, it will take infinite time. So like, if, if you can just decide that you're going to spend a week on something, you will likely accomplish in that week what if you had given yourselves three, you would have accomplished in three, right? Not always, but often. And so things like self-imposed limits, uh, single tasks, Pomodoro. Another way to put this is art needs limits. Has anybody heard art needs limits as a, as a phrase? Like, it's really difficult to have a blank canvas with nothing in front of you. But if I tell you that what you're going to do is paint a landscape of, a, uh, of, of Ghent, suddenly it's quite easy, right? So the more limitations you can give to yourself, if you need them, the better. But limitations are your friend. OK, so that's how I would go about actually doing the work. How much time do I have left? Is anybody checking on time? Okay, I didn't hear an answer, so we're just going to keep going until someone's like, please, God, get us dinner, or like lunch. Okay. Um, I'm at time? No, you're, you're out of time, actually. But oh, I'm out of time. Yeah. This is why I asked. Why didn't you say something? <laughs> oh, I didn't ask because I was like, don't tell me. I'm like, I feel like I'm fucking rambling on. The answer is you're rambling on. Wrap it up. Okay. Um, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Fine, I'm wrapping it up. Here's the thing. Uh, places you might could go. One is composition. Uh, there's a great paper, it's called Lineage Driven Fault Injection, uh, where what he was doing was finding out that right now the best way to test a giant distributed system is to, is to design a formal model of it and then test the formal model, but it's really complicated. And so this guy decided that what if we could just trace the relationships between the in pieces of it and then we test the breakage of the relationships instead of the algorithms on the inside. It's genius. Um, and it's part of what went into habitat, it's part of what goes into promise theory and some of the evolution of those things. So one place you might could look is composition. How do we compose things together uh, and how do we make them relate to each other? Another is operating systems. I think we still haven't actually built an operating system that was designed to be automated. And I think if we did, it would be amazing. And I think now is the time. We could actually be quite disruptive in operating systems right now. We're not being very disruptive. We're just going, the disruption's a container. But like, we could do some crazy bullshit if we wanted to. Um, distributed systems. Um, Gossip protocols, truly distributed decision making. If you say that you're building a distributed system, but what you're doing is using etcd, you're not building a distributed system, you're using a database. Um, but don't, no, 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 oh. That's what you're doing. It's a distributed database, but come on, it's a database. Don't kid yourself. But I think there's a lot you could do here um, about, uh, about building truly distributed decision making and configuration management. That's not a slide on etcd. It's a great thing. It's just, anyway. Um, Wire protocols, service discovery, serverless. Serverless isn't about not having servers, it's about how we connect the things, the wire, to the function, right? What happens if we actually had convergent wire protocols? What's promise theory like as a unit of application state or application relationships on the wire? Finally, uh, contracts. Uh, you could think about smart contracts. And what would it be like to have smart contracts that define the relationships between different components in the system uh, and then use that to drive convergent operating behavior? So I'll leave you with Alan's quote. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. Uh, I've loved this discipline and these people uh, for the last 20 years of my life. Um, and I'm 40, so that's fully half of my life so far has been devoted to only this one task and banging this particular set of drums. Uh, 
And I hope that you take everything you can from me and from Mark and from Luke and from each other. And I can't wait to see uh, what things you will build uh, and the soap bubbles you will pop. Thank you. <laughs>